Thank you, Loretta. Um, thank you, Hunter, for what you're going to do next week. Okay. We uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Loretta, for the song "Call in the Middle." You know, um, we and you know this because I know your mom told you. But when we were in Belize, uh, Ken Barber sang the same song, and I would like to. <clears throat> I would like to make this pronouncement that he plays the guitar a lot better than you, but you are a hundred times better singer than him. <laughs> so I give both of you a compliment since you don't play the guitar. It's a malfunction in the speaker system. But this morning, I, I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, if you will, the third chapter. Uh, we preached on the second chapter last week. We're going to preach on the third chapter this week. <laughs> As we think about that song that Loretta sang, um, caught in the middle, in, in a sense, uh, this is what the message is about this morning. The, the, the title of the message today is uh, Seeking God's Rest. We're seeking God's final rest when we can uh, go to heaven and be with Him and rest from our sickness, rest from our uh, physical diseases, uh, when we can rest from many of the jobs we've had in this, la in this life when they have been so tedious, and when we can rest from our struggle with ourself and our sin nature, when we can rest from our battles with Satan and God's enemies in this world. And that's going to be a glorious day one day when we can enter into our rest. And in the meantime, we're caught in the middle. We're caught in the middle of, uh, this just really fits in the message, we're caught in the middle of uh, a heaven which is holy and a, and a world which is evil. We're, we're caught in the middle between uh, a God who is holy and righteous and a, a devil who is evil and uh, wants to destroy us. We're caught in the middle between angels in heaven who are, are good angels, holy angels, and angels on this earth which we can't visibly see, but we know they hear, who are very evil and wicked and want to do us harm. So we're caught in the middle. Caught in the middle of a life in this world uh, which is is enjoyable, but still, we're not home yet. We're in we're in a land where we're uh, we have enemies all around us in a wicked world. In the middle of that, and, and our final home in heaven. So we are we are caught in the middle. Uh, we begin Hebrews this morning. We think about that rest that one day we we seek for, and that God is going to give us and has promised us. He says in the third chapter, the first verse, Wherefore, O holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. So it's a, a typical greeting here in, in, on the third verse. And he's talking to the Christians there. And he's talking about the fact that we have a heavenly calling. And you, you I think you can read into that in exegesis the fact that uh, our calling to Christ and to God in salvation is a heavenly calling. It's, a, it's an effectual calling. And in, in regeneration, when God uh, comes to us and imparts spiritual life into us, it is part of our heavenly calling. It's, in a sense, the beginning of our calling that experientially involves us. All the things before the everlasting covenant which God did before the foundation of the world with the Son. The, the electing and parting and separating and, and setting apart those that, that will be saved uh, happen by God before the foundation of the world. We weren't involved in either of those things. And then we have 
the, the fact that God gave to Jesus uh, all those that he is to die for, which is akin to election, but still it's a, it's a giving of God to Jesus, which we had nothing to do with. That's all of God. Uh, when we're, when we're, we're saved, we're set apart, and we're, we're justified uh, in our salvation, justification is something that God himself does. We have no part in that. And even when we come to the, the part where we begin to become involved in an actual, real-time salvation experience, we really do not have any part in our regeneration. So all these things are of God. And it, it's amazing when you think of how much God is involved in our salvation. And when you believe the scriptures in a truthful way, the doctrines of grace teach us that not only is God involved in part of our salvation, but God is involved in every single bit of our salvation. Man is not involved in anything at all. Even the faith and the goodness that we have are said by the scriptures to be gifts of God. God gives us even the faith to believe because that's the only way that faith could be effectual and it could work. Our faith from a dead sinner, if you could even have faith, would be totally useless. There's nothing within the man that can cause him to be a part of his own salvation. I almost preached this morning on Phineas. I'm going to save it for another time. But Charles Finney, just very briefly this morning, was a preacher who was preaching in the uh, 1900s, 19th century, 1800s. And those preachers around him were many, many preachers of the Reformed faith who were preaching the fact that God is in charge of salvation. And yet Finney came along, uh, being a lawyer, and turned all that on his head and became in his study and his doctrine a pure Pelagian. And Pelagius, in the early centuries of the church, debated with Augustine much of his life, saying that man controls everything. God doesn't control anything. And Pelagius taught that man can lift himself up, save himself, he is in charge of his own destiny. And it was an extreme form of what was to come later in James Arminius' teaching in Arminianism. Finney is really worse than Arminius because Finney says the same thing Pelagius said, that man really is in charge of revivals, man is in charge of salvation, and man is able, without God's help, to accomplish anything he wants to accomplish. And the sad thing is this, that during that time, Spurgeon was living similar, a, similar, a similar time frame to Finney, and as wonderful and as great and as glorious as Spurgeon was, and as much as we love him, and as much as we preach the same gospel that he preached, Finney influenced masses of people across the world in his lectures on theology. And much of that is still intact today. And that's where we have a large influx of Armenian teaching in our day. It's been watered down some but it still teaches that man is ultimately in control, not God. We know that's just simply not true. He talks about, author Hebrews does in this first verse, a heavenly calling. He doesn't say an earthly calling. He doesn't say a calling by man. 
But he says, a heavenly calling. And then he says, concerning the apostle and high priest in our profession, talking about Jesus. That, that explanation of calling Jesus an apostle is only in the New Testament. And it is, it's kind of like Arthur Peak uh, called Jesus the first elect. Because he was elected of God to be the head of the church. And we who follow after him as his children are elect as he was. Jesus was the first apostle that God sent to, to start the apostolic ministry in the New Testament. And the apostles that followed him as disciples were students of his. And then he says in 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him, God, as also Moses was faithful to all his house, in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, and as much as he who has hath built the house, hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is of God. He talks about building the house, and we know that he's talking about here uh, his church and his people as a house, as he mentions. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, when you build a house, it's an interesting thing. We're building, we're having a, a house building now in Relius and in, in Belize. And it's going to be our reception center. It's going to be, it's going to house uh, my protege, Brother Pleasanton. Uh, he's having a special room built for him. Uh, and it's going to have a bookstore. We're going to have reformed books all in the bookstore. It's going to have a little place where we, we went to an English tea room when we took Adam back in the summer when he, when he left. We found it up near Bear, Delaware. And uh, we, we went in there and it was a neatest little place. They had little cups of tea and it was a kind of an atmosphere, an English atmosphere. And, uh, they wanted to know why we were bringing all these Scottish people in here. And uh, we got away with that, but uh, they still got the little thing going. But she's got to build one of those in, in, inside that same house, and people can come there and they can they can get a book and they can read or they can uh, use the library or they can you, you can just sit there and have refreshments or just hang out. It's going to be a great place to witness to local people and also yeah. tourists to come yeah. and also other people that would come there and so it's going to be in this form of a castle we, we went to scotland and we love the castles there and we went to a lot of them and um, we stayed in a lot of them uh, and and we had a wonderful time and i, I just love castles and, uh, i know henrietta loves castles and so um, it's going to be unique but it's being built now and Jeff is entrusted with that responsibility. And even though we're there, we're trusting him to build it correctly. And it's going to be two stories, got the, the little turrets on the top of each corner. And it's going to be a unique thing for the glory of God. But we're not there overseeing the job. But it's being built. And, and that's, in a way, what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the fact that um, the house is built and the house is going to be not a physical house in this case, but the house is a house uh, that God has given to Jesus and that is all of his people and his elect and his, his ones that belong to him. Now, Jesus is not here with us. He's allowed the Holy Spirit to come. But the house is still being built every day. People are being added to the family of God every day. Amen. And the house of Jesus Christ is being built on, on this earth. And then we see another thing there. It says in, in verse 5, that Moses barely was faithful in his house as a servant, for as a testimony to those things which were to be spoken after. Verse 6 says, 
But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. I want you to notice something. Moses was faithful in his house. But the house that Jesus is believing, is building, is his house. Moses is working for somebody else's house. The house that Jesus is building, because of the prepositions here, is the house that is all his house belonging to him. So, as we look at the church, we know that it belongs to Jesus, and we belong to Jesus. Amen. And in verse 7 he says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now he's going to go back and he's going to talk about the wilderness. He's talking and leading us toward having that blessed rest that, that one day God will give us when we go gone from this earth and gone to be with Jesus. But he's kind of comparing it to the wilderness experience and what happened to the Jews there. And, and nowhere in the third chapter is he saying that, that any Christian is going to fall, any Christian is going to fail and lose his salvation. But he is issuing a warning and encouragement to everyone who is part of the house of Jesus to not take it for granted, to not take our faith for granted, to not take the salvation that God has given us for granted and to be faithful in everything we do. So then he says, 9, When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, talking about the, the Hebrew children, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall never enter into my rest. My rest, my rest, my rest. He said they, they had hardness of heart. And I think probably they had hardness of brain as well. But they really grieved the Lord. And they always erred in their hearts. And God finally rejected them and would not allow them to enter into the promised land. And when we talk about the promised land in the Old Testament, it's like so much of the Old Testament. It is, it is a, a, a shadow of the New Testament. And entering into the promised land of Israel in the Old Testament is a physical entering. But it's a shadow and a type of the entering into the kingdom of God in the New Testament and the eventual entering into heaven itself. It's a type. And he's just issuing a warning. He said, listen, uh, in, in essence, what he's saying is, all those people there, all of them were not saved. Some of them just did not want to do the will of God. And most of them were evil. And I did not let them enter into my rest. Now that's sad. We have a multitude, millions upon millions upon billions, really billions. In the last 2,000 years since Jesus came, who are just like the children of Israel, they err in their ways, they love their sins, they love their pleasure more than they want to walk in faith and walk with the Lord. And do the Lord's will. And billions upon billions are going to end up separated from God for eternity. You don't hear that preached much. But if you don't preach that, you're not preaching the scripture. If, if you don't preach that, you're not warning people that they're in trouble 
and that their ways are going to lead them into an eternal hell. And so, they will not enter into their rest. Think about that. These people who reject Christ and don't want anything to do with Him, they don't want to go to heaven because if they go to heaven, they're going to have to live like Jesus wants them to live here and they don't want to live that way here and they're not going to want to live that way in heaven. Amen. They do not want in this life to spend their time in fellowship with Christian people and when they die, they are not going to want to go to heaven and be miserable all through eternity having to hang out with a bunch of boring Christians. They don't want that. They want to sing the music in the bars that they love to sing, whether it be country music or rock and roll music or or, or rap music or whatever it may be. But they do not want to go to heaven because there they're going to have to listen to music that is glorifying God, talking about, about wonderful spiritual concepts, and they would be miserable listening to that kind of music. So they... They choose to live their life the way they want to live it, without God. And by doing, they are choosing to live their life the same way they're going to live after they're dead and have no physical life in this world without God. And people think that, some people think God should save everyone. But you say, why should God be obligated to save people like this? They don't want anything to do with Him. If you went to a place today and there was somebody that hated you and hated everything you stood for, do you think they would invite you home to, 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 to eat with them and have fellowship? No way. So, you can't blame God because people love their sin. Amen. They love it because they love it. Yeah. Amen. And some of us in the past may have, have loved it. So, they will not get the rest. And, and the worst thing about it is this. That just like the Hebrew children did not enter into their rest, these people, even though they choose it for themselves, they would rather sacrifice their eternal rest to enjoy their sin today and forsake all eternity when they can finally get some rest, finally get away from sin, finally get away from the, the bondage they're in, the various things. Finally get away from those friends who don't love them as lost people would do everything they can to, to, to stab them in the back. Finally get away from having to trudge and, and work in jobs that they don't like, that they hate in order to go and blow all their money on Friday night doing wasteful things. They would finally be able to get a rest from those things but they don't want the rest. It's really, a, it's really a backward type of mentality that makes you think uh, opposite from reality. And we have that same kind of thinking in our world today, in our politics. They will get no rest. Verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. God knows, and the author of Hebrews knows, that no Christian is going to be lost after they're saved. But he still 
talks about the fact that we should exhort one another and encourage one another daily that we don't let sin have a victory over us. 14 says, For we are made partakers of Christ, and if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, they provoked. Now be it, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? He finally just says, the ones that fell in the wilderness with Moses were the ones that were the sinners, were the ones that loved their sin, were the ones that worshipped the golden calf. He is also implicating here and indicating the fact that there are some people like Judas who sat at the table with Jesus and the other disciples, who walked with Jesus day by day, every day, and yet was a devil. He was not of them. He was among them, but he wasn't of them. The author of Hebrews knows that there are people in the church who are not really saved. They're not really Christians. They're evil and they're deceitful and they're there. And we have proof of that by the study we've done the last month or two in the book of 2 Corinthians, which we just finished this last Wednesday night. Paul had a church which was filled in Corinth with people who, who hated him. No, he had enough. And these people that were there who had slipped in as wolves and they had come in and they were slandering Paul and they were putting him down. And while he was absent, they were trying to take over the church and turn it into something that was not of Jesus Christ. And we studied in detail about all the things they did. There was immorality in the church. There were those people that were sleeping with members of their own family. There were, were people who were involved in other sins of impurity. And there were people who were false prophets who were, were trying to, to, to preach these uh, high-minded sermons. And, and it wasn't of Jesus, but it was about themselves. So he knows here that everybody who's in the church is not a part of the church of Christ. He knows here that, that everybody that sits in a pew on Sunday doesn't necessarily have the love of Jesus in their heart or a love for Jesus in their heart. Amen. I don't think it's true in our church, but I, 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 I know that it's true in so, so many many churches across the world. Amen. In other words, he's, he knows that there are people who are goats and they think they're sheep. Are they goats and they don't even pretend to be sheep? I think if you put the people, some of those people in 2 Corinthians, in Corinth, beside these people right here in Hebrews, they could have a wonderful time in the devil because they're all the same people. And then he talks to the ones who are saved and he says, you know, he says other places, make your calling and election sure. Don't take it for granted. Listen, Paul says, I run the race. And he didn't never, he never says, never does he say, I want to win the race. But he says, I want to finish the race. Amen. I want to cross the finish line. Yeah. Amen. I don't care if I win. I just want to get there. And, and that thought is consciously is mine. And, and I think the author of Hebrews is telling us something similar that we need as true Christians to have a desire in our hearts 
to not just start out and then quit, but to start out and run the good race, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how discouraging it is, and finish the race. You know, there's a, when we talk about eternal security, there's, there's, there's a couple of different words and expressions that are used in that doctrine. One is eternal security, which God gives us, and we will have it. Another is the perseverance of the saints. Now, now usually, I, I, like, I like the wording eternal security because it puts an emphasis on God and it gives us real security and it's a lot more secure than social security. Without a doubt. But you know, that puts an emphasis on God. And some scholars and some preachers, they, they use that terminology. There are other teachers down through the years who have used the fact that we cannot lose our salvation ever. They describe that as perseverance of the saints. Now, I don't use that too much because in a sense, in one sense, it, it seems to be saying that, or someone could, could misuse it and misrepresent it to say, the Christians are persevering themselves and they're keeping their own salvation. Now, now somebody could use an argument against us. And they could distort it. That's why I like to put the emphasis on God. But I think that term, perseverance of the saints, which if you understand it, you, you understand the true meaning of it, could apply more with this verse, these verses here in Hebrews, than eternal security. Because what the author of Hebrews is saying is, is, is in essence, uh, God is going to keep your salvation, and we know that God is not going to let you fall. But you need to do everything you can in your mind and your actions to persevere to the end. Because in years, years I think a real, a real important part of this. If you do persevere to the end, that automatically means that you are saved. That you are His. That He helps you and He held you in His hand. And he allowed and he calls you and gave you the strength to persevere, not three-fourths of the way, but all the way to the end. And you've been proven, it's been proven to you now at the end of the line, when you go to heaven, that you really were a child of God. That you were able to persevere. That you did persevere to the end. And if you persevere to the end, you're going to make it. You're going to get into heaven. You're going to be with Jesus. And then I think we also have to remember as we look at it that way and keep in mind that we had nothing to do with that perseverance as far as making it into heaven. God and all of it He did with Jesus and all of His work is the reason we're going to heaven. Not that we can earn our interest in the heaven in any, any way. But you recognize the fact that God is sovereign in salvation. And you recognize the fact that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done for your salvation. And you recognize the fact that the Holy Spirit, all three being involved, has come to you and regenerated you and quickened you and brought you to faith and given you faith to believe and has, has secured your salvation and clenched it forever. And then the Godhead will keep you saved for eternity because they are the ones that did all this and they're the ones responsible and they are beloved the only ones that can ever keep a sinner's salvation forever it has to be a divine infinite 
entity that keeps your salvation.